Good evening. Welcome to another Wednesday evening and Bible study from the book of Nehemiah. This week we are looking at Nehemiah chapter 3. It's a difficult chapter for many persons because it has a lot of names, but I think that we will be able to deal with it. I'm going to entitle this study, All Hands on Deck. Now, most older commentaries focus on the gates in this chapter. They build a useful gospel message from one gate to the next. In fact, um, I'm sure you will have a picture of the gates and how they function. And what happened is that they list the ten gates. The sheep gate, the fish gate, the old gate. And they put meanings to them. I will just run through that very quickly. They say that the sheep gate represents Jesus' sacrifice. The fish gate representing the need for us to witness to men. The old gate represents the submission to God's revealed will. The valley gate is a need for humility. The dung gate is a need for holiness. The fountain gate represents the work of the Holy Spirit. The water gate represents the word of God. The horse gate represents war against the world and, and Satan. The east gate represents Christ's coming. And the master gate represents the judgment. Now, all of these gates appear in different places throughout the, um, the text. But I want to offer a different perspective for chapter 3. For me, the passage seems to emphasize teamwork. The passage focuses also on organization. And these are the things I want you to see. If you remember, in chapter 2, verse 17, we read, we read, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins, with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision or we no longer suffer disgrace. I believe that if you understand that, then you understand the goal of chapter 3 because everyone must understand the goal. And in chapter 3, we see that everybody understood the goal and then everybody must know the reason for the goal. And the reason, as stated in verse 17 of chapter 2, is that there will be no more disgrace to the land. And then everyone must understand his or her importance in achieving the goal. And I believe that is still true when it comes to the church. Is that in church, if everybody don't understand what the mission of the church is, if everybody does not see themselves as part of the, 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 the persons who are going to achieve that mission, if they don't understand the reason for the mission, then there is quite likely we will not get the kind of support that we need. This chapter, I believe, is one of the chapters that really shows what leadership and teamwork is about. I'm going to pick out some verses and make some points as it relates to the whole matter of teamwork and leadership throughout this chapter 3. And the first verse is the first verse I want to read. Then Elishib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated as far as the tower of the hundred, as far as the tower of Hananel. Now, when you look at this verse, two things jump out that are of importance. The first is that the leaders, the high priests and the priests, took the lead. They started the work. They took the lead. And I think it is very, very important whenever the church is going to go forward or any organization that the leaders take the lead. Secondly, it said they rose up. And the tense in which it is written, you see that they were not commanded. They did it voluntarily. And I think again that leaders in fair sphere have to begin to take the lead. They don't need anybody to push them. They must see that the work needs to be done and start the work. Second verse I want to look at is verse 2, and it says, And next to him the men of Jericho built, and next to them Zachor the son of Imri built. And throughout the entire book we see the next to him, and next to him, or next to them. And, and this tells me three things. One, what is important if the work is going to be completed is the spirit of teamwork. And then secondly, the dependence on each upon the other, because next to him and next to him. It also shows the organization of the work. And so here we have three fundamental things that are important as the church moves forward. Is that we need everybody on the team, all hands on deck. 
then we need to re remember that we are dependent on one another. The text in the New Testament says that we are uh, one body. We are uh, members of one another. And the organization of, of our various gifts are important to the advancement of the work. Next verse I want to look at is verse 5. Because this is important in every single time that there is work. And verse 5 reads like this. And next to them, the Tecotes the the repaired. But, notice that conjunction, their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. So when you have a team of persons working on any task in a big group like a church, there are going to be those who are not willing to work. And I think that's something that we have to understand. There are going to be some people who are not willing to work. And there are three points I want to make from this verse. The first is this. The conjunction makes a contrast with those who are willing and those who felt they were too good for the work. Interestingly, the Hebrew word that is used there, say they were afraid to show their necks, which means they're afraid to bend down. The work was beneath them. And um, there are some of us sometimes in church who feel there are certain jobs that are beneath us. That speaks to our pride. And we have to get rid of that because Jesus didn't think anything was beneath him. This is the reason why in John chapter 13, we find him washing the disciples' feet. And you would have remembered Peter's reaction. And Jesus said, the key is to serve one another. In this text also, if we just read the verse again a little bit, it says, they did not stoop to serve their Lord. So one of the things we have to understand is that when we do a work in church, we are serving the Lord, not anybody else. The service is unto the Lord. So, you know, what, what job is too great or too small to do for the Lord? And then there's another interesting little twist in the text. If we read it again, it says, But their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. Can I tell you that in the Hebrew text, the word nobles is the same word as Lord? I, I, I think the, the, the translators distinguish it. To make you know the nobles different from the Lord up above. But realize this. What the writer of the Hebrew did was put a play on the word. There's a pun. And so it could read, but the lords did not want to serve the Lord. So the word for nobles is the word lords. And what happened is that the lords, they felt they were lords. And they did not want to serve the Lord. We have to be careful. Like sometime in church... Some of us come to a place where we feel that um, we don't owe anything to anybody. But you always owe something to the Lord. Verse 10 is the next verse I want to pick out. It says, Next to them, Jedidah the son of Harumaf repaired opposite his house. And next to him, Hatush the son of Hashabneha repaired. Now, notice this. What the things that we find in this text on a number of occasions is this. Some were assigned jobs that were convenient. If you notice, they were repaired near their house. And some were assigned jobs that fit their personal interests. And that's all right. When we are uh, assigning people jobs, many times we can make it convenient for them to do the job. More likely or not, if it's convenient for them to do the job, they will do the job. Also, if they have a personal interest, they'll do the job. Notice the place they were repairing was opposite their house. It was. It is to their benefit that the section of the wall that was repaired would be good because it was near their house. They would benefit the greatest by this piece of wall being repaired. And, and, and when we are dealing with people on teams and people with different abilities, it is fine, it is okay to allow persons to do that which they are personally interested in. If you are personally interested in something, you give it more of your energy, more of your time. My mother always said that the person who sees a fault is a person who should mend the fault. Because usually if you can see a fault, that means you have an eye for it. And, and, and the whole matter of leadership, whether it is in church or any other place, we want to help persons to be you, to be uh, the greatest value to the work by using the skills that they have. Now in verse 12, we have a very interesting situation. It said, next to him, 
Shalom, the son of Halohesh, ruler of the half district of Jerusalem, prepared he and his daughters in a Hebrew text, uh, work on the wall. But here we have the uh, inclusive nature. Every single person is important to the work. And here we see in this text, the women were included in the work. They were not left out. Now, of course, there are many persons who have all kinds of theories. But I think here we have the, um, the seed of what we find in the New Testament and in chapter 4 of Ephesians, that every single person how, who is gifted, every single person is gifted, and every single person must use their gift to advance the kingdom. So all hands on deck. Every single person is needed for the work. I, I long for the day when church will see every single person involved in the work. There, it, it, it is just so, so wrong that in our churches, uh, less than 20% of the people do all the work, while the others become spectators as if they are going to a theatre. But God did not serve you to sit down. There is a, a woman who was in our church, but is in heaven now. And she usually say, God did not call us to sit on the premises, but to sit on the promises. And what happened is that so many people are sitting on the premises and they are waiting to be entertained as if we are out in the world in a theatre. But every single person is needed for the work. And gender don't make a difference. God has called you. You are his child. He has gifted you. Then you need to make a contribution to the work of the church. If you understand the mission of the church, then you should understand your role in that mission to advance the church. Notice in verse 16. It says, After him Nehemiah the son of Azbok, ruler of half the district of Bethzor, repaired to a point opposite the tombs of David as far as the artificial pool and as far as the house of the mighty men now in this verse what we find is that the rebuilding preserved the significant sites they preserved the tomb of david they preserved the artificial pool and they preserved the house of the heroes i want to say when we're building or when we're rebuilding we must not forget those who have made significant contributions in the past we must always remember to hold up our history. Where there are things that remind you of the contribution of others, don't remove them, don't just dash them out, don't just throw them away. You must recognize that whatever you are doing now, it's a rebuilding. So there were significant things that went on prior to your rebuilding. And so you can never ever um, discount the kind of effort that was put into the work by those who went before. And it is important for us to remember their work and to repeat the work. For those who are now existing are existing because of the work that they did. And for Bethel, I can say, the work of Albert T. Karam, for instance, cannot be forgotten. The work of Dr. Clive Affleck cannot be forgotten. The work of Elder Lloyd Buchanan cannot be forgotten. The work of Elder Johnson cannot be forgotten and there are myriads of names but I want to say that as we rebuild the work as we rebuild the people as we rebuild the structure then we must always remember those who have made significant contributions we must not rebuild without preserving the significant sites as well as the significant people that the history will continue to lift them up for their contribution now in verse 26 it says and the temple servants living at Ophel, repaired to a point opposite the water gate on the east side and the projecting, and the projecting tower. Now, wh what we find here then is the importance of the gates and the towers. Both the gates and the towers are of significance. Both are for the protection of the city. And so, when you reach those points at the stop, notice the towers provided information for preparation. Once... Um, the watchmen were in the tower, they could see if somebody was coming to attack and they would then sound the alarm. There has to be, as we rebuild both people and structure, a point where we are allowing ourselves to be able to see, see things that are going to be important to the work, see things that are coming as an opposition to the work. 
the leadership of a church, and it's because we're talking about church, must have some towers, not literally, but there must be a way in which they are able to discern. Because if we are not able to discern certain things and certain trends, then we are going to have a problem. What I find very often is that the people within a church or organization many times get itching ears. And they want to be like the church over there. Or they pick up something from the television or some program and they want to incorporate it. The people on the towers must be able to pick up when they are doing that. The text in Ephesians that we looked at recently says, Don't let people deceive you with empty words. So when persons come with new things, it needs to be tested by the word of God. So we need to be able to, to see and discern. Um, I'll give you one that I have a difficulty with. People come and they talk about the Daniel fast. But Daniel was not fasting. What they call a Daniel fast was a Daniel's resistance to the king and the food of the king. And so he ate vegetables. He was not establishing a, 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 a principle or what am I trying to say. Then he was not establishing something. He was not prescribing something for us to follow. The, the text is just recording what Daniel did as he opposed the whole matter of eating the king's food. As we build people, we must help them to be able to see and to discern information, see things that are coming against the work of God and to withstand it. Notice the gates were, were manned to allow selective entrance. When you are building a church, when you are building a congregation, we have to be sure that what we let in, when we let people into our pulpit, that what we let in into that pulpit is consistent with the scriptures. We don't just let everything in. So in this um, chapter, I'm raising the question, I'm raising the argument rather, that the chapter is about teamwork. Teamwork that is focused on a, a particular mission. In the case at Bethel Gospel Assembly, we, our mission is to win this community. Our mission is to declare who God is by the way we live, by the lives we, 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 we lead, by allowing the Holy Spirit to, to work through us, to live through us, to manifest through us who Jesus Christ is. That's what the mission is. And we need to build everybody, all those who come in uh, by accepting Jesus Christ, need to be brought to the place, as the text says in Matthew, where they obey every single thing that God has commanded them to do. You and I, we are the ones who have to ensure that the mission of the church is accomplished. We leaders must take the lead. We must take the lead. We can't wait on persons to push us. As we build people, we must give them the opportunity to serve every single hand on deck. There must not be a member of a church who only comes and sit. Every single member need to be a part of the work. You see what happened at the end of chapter 3, get in chapter 4? They completed the work. If we are going to accomplish the work, we need every single person to be involved. We need to make it convenient for some to be able to work um, to get them to work. We need to ensure that some persons are doing the things that are within their comfort zone. But every single person need to work. We never want people like the nobles who believe that they cannot stoop to serve their Lord. I trust today as you listen to this Bible study that you would not be one of those who believe that you are too, uh, too high to stoop to serve your Lord. For God stooped to serve you when Jesus left heaven and came to earth and died on the cross of Calvary. God bless you.